welcome. I am with William uh, Hernandez Requejo. Did I pronounce that correctly? You most certainly did. Thank you. Oh, good. I was hoping. <laughs> I was hoping. And we are recording an interview for the Cable Consortium and for our student delegates to watch. And um, so if you wouldn't mind, William, starting by just telling us a little bit about um, your career, how you got to where you are. Well, um, first of all, I want to thank you, Melinda. Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, just to share with you some of our perspectives on, uh, on what we find to be such an incredibly fascinating area, the concept of leadership. But um, uh, let me, if I may, just share with you a little bit of why, why we think the way I do, why I think the way I do, and why we at the Center for Global Leadership here at the Paul Mirage School of Business um, uh, take tremendous pride in, in looking at collaborations with people such as yourself. So. Um, you can probably tell by my accent that I wasn't born in this country. Um, I wasn't. I was actually born in Cuba. What many of us would just consider as a, a, a natural evolution of a human being, which is the ability to compare two very distinct cultures. And the fact that I happen to be born in another country sort of uh, created the basis upon which uh, uh, many of the philosophies and, and thinking that I do um, it, it, because of that, right? So what am I saying? Um, so I came to the United States and uh, in doing that, I, uh, I uh, have English as a second language and that became the point of comparing and contrasting what is, uh, how do you say things in Spanish? How do you say things in English? And that in and of itself developed uh, a very unique way of perceiving the world. In so doing, um, I started off here at UCI um, with an undergraduate degree in uh, political science specializing in international business. Um, but um, in essence, what happened was is that I didn't have Spanish to a sufficiently high enough level because I had never studied it. So what happened was is that I did my junior year abroad and that transformed my life. Um, I was able to do uh, a one entire year in Spain. I got my Spanish up to a level of proficiency that in turn led me to continue and grab a master's degree. I was able to uh, uh, do some really uh, uh, cognitive work, um, you know, articulate work in, in both Spanish and English. That led to then uh, continuing to develop in the area of uh, international law. I went to Georgetown Law, specializing in international law, working with strategic alliances, joint ventures, in a way of putting all that together. Um, but in doing so, what happened was that I always had one foot in, uh, in academia. Um, I, I value academic work, and so I split much of my time, most of it now at my age, uh, mostly in academia, although I have the distinct honor and pleasure of also working with some pretty advanced teams on international strategic alliances, joint ventures, and collaborative types of work. Great. That's wonderful. Um, what leadership habits do you think helped you in your career? Um, I took down some notes here, and I, and I asked you to sort of bear with me, but I thought that was a particularly interesting question. Um, because, um, as you might sense, and from my background, because um, we are in fact a product of our circumstances, right? Um, uh, I always thought that perhaps the most salient um, attribute is really a liberal education, and uh, and I think that that liberal education has actually established uh, uh, the development of many leadership skills in many ways. Um, it's the ability of course, to be able to read and write well and to do some critical thinking and to establish oneself within a larger context or environment, I think that's fundamentally critical. Um, but in doing so, I think everyone recognizes that leadership is a soft skill. It's not one of these hard sciences that we can work with, right? And as a soft skill, it's difficult to quantify and difficult to objectivize, right? And so um, in this world, that where the large focus is on STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I encourage anyone that's seeking a leadership position to get into those soft skills, to, um, to in fact, to listen, to listen intently, to listen consciously, um, uh, especially to those issues at hand, whether it's at a global level or whether it's uh, uh, listening to data that's coming at you from all sides, whether that happens to be the data coming at us from the destruction of the earth to listening to individual issues associated with a particular team you may be leading. 
um, which leads me then to perhaps a long list of what, uh, what those uh, um, habits can look like. Um, obviously, one of the habits is, I think, is empathy implied in that listening, but truth seeking, uh, guiding through chaos, uh, decisiveness, uh, breaking rules and writing new ones. Um, my book, uh, Global Negotiation, The New Rules, establishes that. Uh, risk taking propensity is one, uh, which means having a certain level of uh, ability to be uh, uh, comfortable with uncertainty. Um, to some extent, that means you have to give up a grand plan. Um, Linda Hill at Harvard did some really good work along that. I would encourage anyone that, uh, that wants to get into this concept of innovative le leadership that we perhaps look at that as well. Um, we need to recognize that we are limited in our knowledge and by doing so, um, that means that by almost definition, we have to work in a collaborative manner. Um, we need to be, leaders need to be great storytellers. They need to be able to tell a narrative. They need to be able to, to entice and persuade by that most basic of, of instincts that we have is to listen to, to stories around a campfire, for example. Um, we need to be able to present and encourage uh, contrarian views and those contrarian views are, are fundamental because it opens up varying perspectives. Um, we need to leave all options open to the very, very last possible moment. Um, but if we're going to increase or bring the concept of, of uh, leadership up to a higher level, I encourage uh, the concept that we here at the school call the ability to be global, meaning the ability to be global that is to think globally, but to act locally, mm -hmm. and uh, which requires continuous experiment. And that in turn leads to what we call the collective genius of the team or of the network that we've hopefully been able to you know, put around us in one form or another. You mentioned some work by Linda Hill. Would you mind, do you happen to know the title of that work? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I'll get that most certainly to you. Thank um, you. But she's at Harvard. And she's, you Google her and she'll show up everywhere. Her areas, um, I, one of her works is on uh, uh, independent, uh, in innovative leadership. She calls it. Wonderful. I apologize for the barking dog. I would mute myself, but then I couldn't ask questions. Not at all. What type of dog? He's a miniature poodle. And we have a Yorkie, so oh, <laughs> they would get along quite well. My little one is 13 years old, but he still feels the need to make his presence known when when the male person drives by. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I'm going to look into that because one of the things we've with Linda Hill uh, and her research, one of the things we've looked at this year is the need for um, not just an ability to uh, manage risk, but an ability to be comfortable in risk, and. Uh, so you call it a propensity toward risk taking. And we were looking at it as kind of a comfort with risk. And then how do you manage it? But, but that comfort is important. It's not about minimizing the risk all the time. Sometimes it's about kind of wallowing in it and being totally okay in it and, and not feeling anxiety when there's risk. And um, so that I can think we're trying to expand the definition of, of how we look at um, kind of being risk okay, not risk averse. And I can't agree more with that statement. You're most certainly right. Um, we, we actually view that for within a, a, a psychocultural context. And by that, you know, notice we said risk taking propensity. Mm -hmm. But as you know, very many anthropologists view it as uncertainty avoidance, right? Yeah. Leadership, leadership requires that we work with the concept of uncertainty and feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. In, instinctively, um, uh, many people have whatever their comfort level is, and it's being comfortable with yourself in what that comfort comfort level is that yes. really determines your ability to to lead in, well, with all due respect, to lead in potential chaos. Yeah, I think you're right, because if you know your level of comfort with it, then you can surround yourself with the right people, the right team right. to balance your comfort level out. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, throughout your career, which leadership habits do you think people have most often commented about in you? So I alluded to some of those here in my, in my previous uh, comments, but um, perhaps it's really in the area of, uh, of uh, disruptive leadership is really what, what we're talking about. Um, I think it sort of merits uh, uh, a pause here, a parenthetical, in order to be able to uh, look at the definition of disrupt. 
-hmm. I've always found that to be particularly interesting. And, and uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it as uh, to cause something to be unable to continue in a normal way, to interrupt the normal progress of activity of something. Um, and so to that extent, um, I couple that with the concept of, uh, uh, you know, isn't it a true sign of insanity to co the continuation of the same expecting a different result? <laughs> right? So it's, it's this paradigm in which we find ourselves. Uh, there is most certainly a comfort level in the status quo. In, sure. being, able, in being able to say, we've done it this way always, and uh, there's a certain comfort in that. Um, what we're recognizing, especially in, in the area of uh, bioeconomics, right? We're seeing that uh, um, we just can't continue that way. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, um, you know, biofuels and the bioeconomy is one way of disruptively changing that status quo paradigm. And so to that extent, um, we look at that from that larger context, right? And then if you notice, um, disruptive uh, leadership is, is in many ways also based upon the concept of, uh, of innovation. Um, it, innovation by its very definition is disruptive of that status quo, mm -hmm. otherwise it wouldn't be innovative. Sure. So it, it, the reason why we like it here is, is that it begins to sort of break the rules as we said. It's beginning to look at a, at a, at a, at a dilemma in a very different way. And it's that difference that many times engenders a potential new solution. So it's from that capacity that uh, drives us towards uh, uh, a, a better way of leading us out of this conflict in which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think, um, what helped you build that, that view of leadership, do you think? Um, well, um, as I suggested, multiple things, right? The, the leadership, and, and here again, I, 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 have a, I had a wonderful conversation precisely on this topic with Denny, uh, and uh, we view the concept of leadership really as a concept of guidance. Um, leadership, um, if we take, if we, we can look at it in, in multiple ways, and it's the nomenclature that we wish to work with that then begins to have implications. For example, you'll note that leadership is one terminology, but on the other side, you can actually call it management. And the managing of people is in fact a leadership skill. Right. And then if you look at it that way, you can also say that managing can be um, assertive or it can be passive in the sense that a guide can most certainly lead but leads in it with a very different methodology than others. So depending on the attribute that you want to give to it, um, it could be leadership as a leader, could be leaders, uh, management as a manager, or it can be guidance as a guide. And depending on how you assume that responsibility, mm -hmm. that then in turn it gives you a, perhaps a different way of understanding it that in turn can help you better lead, manage, or guide. That makes a lot of sense. And you guys have really focused in your center at how to put disruptive leadership into practice kind of in a global way. Um, how, what, can you talk to us a little about what you're doing to put that into practice? So most certainly, um, uh, we're honored to be associated with the Paul Mirage School of Business and at UCI, the University of California, Irvine. And uh, we at the Center for Global Leadership um, have taken a position that, um, we have to try to make things different. We have multiple programs in which we seek to do that. One of them we call the MBA Peace Building Initiative. And by saying that, um, our MBAs, and I have the distinct honor of leading several teams, our MBAs um, go abroad internationally and create projects that can have a direct impact on the surrounding community. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into many of them, but let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Vietnam and in Cuba, we've uh, uh, found ourselves in what we might describe as transitional governments. These governments are the ones that um, have, until very, very recently, 
then we would euphemistically describe as communist or socialist. And um, if we take it outside of that labeling uh, uh, position, uh, we just see them as uh, governments that if they want or seek to find themselves within a role in the international order, they need to acquire certain skills to be able to interact in that capacity. Right. Whereas, whereas our MBAs um, understand the concept of profitability from a corporate uh, uh, enterprise perspective, many of the decision makers in those two countries don't have those understandings. So we send MBAs to these uh, uh, countries to be able to interact with state-owned enterprises, to begin to teach some of the dynamics necessary for what might be considered uh, 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 market penetration strategies, what might be considered um, a forecasting of, of profitability, and then in turn, in that capacity, have those entities share their knowledge. And notice that I've harbored on the concept of profitability because um, as we're seeing that um, unbridled growth, unbridled profitability, what others describe as Darwinian capitalism or global capitalism that's unleashed is creating havoc upon the world. So what is profitability within a larger context? Is it exclusively the maximization of shareholder value or is it now something that must incorporate other concepts of, for example, sustainability, yeah. other concepts that now transcend that original uh, Adam Smith types of conceptualization of the exchange between entities, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that, and so it's a sharing. We, and I, we describe this, imagine how difficult it is to have a communist country accept what I euphemistically define as the priests of capitalism, the MBAs, right? And so when they accept it, it was a very, very uh, fundamental event for them and by all means for us, because now these priests are uh, beginning to question the axiom upon which they've been taught, which is, does unbridled profitability actually become detrimental to the human race? And yeah. so now all of a sudden they're going through this entire paradigm shift, which is from an academic or pedagogical perspective is what we most certainly want to have our students undergo. Yeah, I love that. I love that they're affecting change, but also that that change is creating, it's causing them to reflect a lot about whether that's all good change and what degree of change and the speed of change. I mean, I can just imagine the, the series of questions you would begin to ask yourself you know, how much of this is a good thing? And at what rate can this country handle this kind of change? And wow. what are the down, downstream impacts of that kind of change? I think that's, those are fantastic questions. Okay, so talk to us about when you guys are, are working on these projects, how important um, are teams? Wow, so I, we, we've been talking about a lot and in this limited amount of time, um, we, I, I'm throwing out a tremendous amount of words, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I go back to Linda, Hill's comments, and he actually raises that concept very nicely. And we've incorporated many years ago into it. Um, part of that is the, the concept of uh, tapping into what we call the collective genius. Um, it's that network environment. Um, using all the means available, whether cultural or technological or philosophical, to drive what we call a meme, right? Um, develop a means by which integrating um, the issues at hand, bringing all those together, and using habits and philosophy that we can describe as uh, uh, taking theory into practice. Um, to that extent, uh, uh, take for example the concepts that we look at, you know, like the genius of crowdsourcing or the organic development of new, of this new culture that we're seeing against uh, sexual harassment, or we're seeing uh, the development of this concept of newness based on history and a reaction to that history. So um, to put it all very succinctly, it's um, uh, we seek to develop disruptive teams. Um, what does that mean? A disruptive team implies diversity. We believe diversity is critical, not only male, female, but diversity as to thought and diversity as to heritage or ethnicity, 
we look at the most disruptive teams, and if you look at the most disruptive teams, you'll recognize that um, in the top research and development uh, centers of the world uh, that are doing some of the most amazing discoveries, it's highly diversified teams that um, uh, have connotations of inventive and creative uh, issues, right? Um, and so we, we value it, we value it incredibly. And, and we do that within perhaps a, a larger context. Um, I think everyone recognizes that saying, uh, uh, you know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach the man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime, right? We're familiar with that. But for those of us here at the center, we sort of look at that. And although at first glance, we tend to agree, and it happens to be a, um, if you look at it carefully, it focuses on the how. How do you teach a man how to fish, right? Um, we like to take it one step further. We ask people not to look at the know-how, we ask them to look at the know-why. It's the know-why that really begins to distinguish that characteristic because then the basis upon which you teach a man how to fish then becomes critical. Many of us recognize that you can stick a dynamite in the water or poison the water and all the fish comes up and you, you fish. And so notice that teaching him or her how to do that is incorrect because now you just you know, destroyed the fish stock. Whereas if you do that with the why you want to do this, now all of a sudden the, the teaching becomes a very distinct issue. So in many ways, then the, the, the leader must teach the why in order to determine the how. Sure, it's setting, I've, I've always learned context. Um, people don't understand why they need to learn something until they understand the context in which it fits. Right. So it's the same thing with leadership. Why, you know, before you teach students leadership habits, they have to understand why those are important and why those are, you know, why are those going to help you and why are they viewed as important by the world? Um, so it's, I think that makes perfect sense. And I don't know why it's kind of funny that you don't hear that a lot in biblical um, circles. I, that's a, be a great sermon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions um, as we move toward the end of this interview. Um, one is just kind of some advice for our students. What advice would you give them um, about the business skills or leadership habits that you think are most likely to help them be noticed as they look for jobs? So I'll, I'll, I'll be very forthright with your students the same way that I am with my students. And um, I ask them something that's, um, if you'll permit me, just to have them step back a little bit. And, and the question that I ask my students is, and I senior level or at the graduate level, but after four years of, of you know, studying at a university, what have they actually learned? I mean, can they actually go out and begin to practice what they've claimed to have studied? And many of them find out that they actually can't. They actually don't have those rudimentary skills that we all have. So then usually what happens is that uh, you see it in their eyes, uh, depression begins to set in. And, and I, I immediately caution them and I tell them, you know what, what has happened over the last four years is you have essentially acquired the skills to become autodidactic, to be able to teach yourself what you need to know. And perhaps that's the greatest skill set that you have. It would be highly presumptuous of, of me to begin to give what I might describe as specific advice to your group of students emphasized in the bioeconomy, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if I may, um, I, I, I would have some general suggestions and I'm going to try to maybe drive down to a, a, a very simple point. Rarely in your lives, I, I would tell my Rarely, if ever, you can have the ability to um, deal with the theoretical. The theoretical is the why. Embrace that theoretical learning. Understand why things are the way they are. And in so doing, then reflect upon that as you apply it in practice. It's that delta 
where the true learning curve is. And leaders embrace that delta in a way of being able to understand the why and then how to make the why through the means necessary better. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, what happens is, is that it forces me to recognize um, the bioeconomy as one means of addressing these issues that confront us in, in, in the concept of the many climactic challenges that we face, right? I mean, it's just bioeconomy uh, and biofuels um, hold very simple. It's a very simple concept that we must incorporate as we seek to find a solution. But I think many of us would recognize that it is but one of multiple potential solutions that we're gonna have to look at. The, the, the monolithic attribute of fossil fuels mm -hmm. is now going to change and we're gonna have to find ourselves um, in a scenario where part of the answer very well may be biofuels, the other may be solar, the other may be wind, the other may be uh, hydrology, or the other may be whatever. But in so doing, recognize that uh, it's only working as a team that we're going to be able to engender this new potential, right? Um, so, um, so you have to have at least a multitude of technological as well as economic implications. I mean, you're going to have to look at this... Uh, this word bioeconomy in perhaps in a larger context. And then in doing so, uh, begin to look at the world that maybe on, on, on what Malcolm Gladwell would describe as a tipping point, right? Um, step back, right. look at where you are. And then in looking at where you are, then be able to drive down to how you particularly are gonna be able to make an impact. Some of you, by uh, your very implications, you're going to be able to uh, uh, address that at what I'll define as a very serious, critical technological level. Some of you are going to have that predisposition to do that, and I encourage you to focus on that, always being attentive of the how and why. But then for those that are more into the policy strategy session, then go way up and look at all the theories and policies that you're working with and see if they actually are able to first and foremost be applied at that practical level, but then at the same time, uh, making sure that that objectives of that at that higher level are most certainly being maintained. I think if we each look at that, um, we're gonna find ourselves um, uh, really uh, uh, reaping the unique rewards and, uh, and also facing some of the amazing challenges that we have ahead of us. It's interesting listening to you talk. I'm struck by the words, the word intentionality. I think you, you are really kind of preaching a level of intentionality that many people don't, um, don't approach or don't um, apply to what they're trying to do. Um, and I think that's really important. I think as, especially as the bioeconomy grows, what you're talking about in terms of asking the hows and the whys and looking deeply at the theories that surround the constructs of why we do what we do. Um, that's, it's really an important thing for our students to hear, um, especially given you know, that um, the bioeconomy is gonna experience ups and downs. And if they wanna ride that out, then the more they ask the hows and whys and, and have some really strong intentionality behind their, um, their movements and behind the, the directions they take, I think uh, that will really help them, it'll serve them well. So I think that's some really good advice. Mm -hmm.